I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You wanna borrow the new car? You wanna borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey! Can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, <laughs> vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Greetings, Mammoth Hills Lutheran Church and Mount Si Lutheran Church. As I am able to record today on Wednesday, I thought for welcome to worship, I'd give our people a, a view of the place they probably miss. For those from Mount Si, this is Mammoth Hills Lutheran Church. Some of you might have been here. Here's your church, ladies and gentlemen. But as we remember, the church is more than just these walls. It is everything outside us. All the people in our city watching at home in these neighborhoods surrounding right now. And so as we gather together for worship today and reflect on the holy place that we're in, even though it's not the holy place that we're used to, I invite everybody to enter into a moment of silence and prayer as we ready our hearts and minds for worship. Father, be with us on this day. Make our own sanctuaries in our living rooms, in our cars, maybe even in our bedrooms, holy places today, where we hear your word of comfort, where we hear your word of challenge, where we are inspired, and where we reflect through the music, through the prayers, through the message, Lord, Enter into our hearts and don't dare leave us the same. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I also welcome everybody today to stick around after worship for our special special Father's Day greeting. And to all you fathers or uncles or grandparents, caregivers, nurturers, teachers out there, happy Father's Day. Let's worship together. Having just welcomed on the outside of our church, looking at the external, we now enter into the inner sanctuary of our church for our brief order of confession and forgiveness. This movement today, I hope, reminds us that oftentimes what we look like on the outside, of course, doesn't always reflect what's happening on the inside. We enter into this brief order of confession and forgiveness each Sunday as that constant reminder that we bring to God and worship all of ourselves, the saint and the sinner, the light and the darkness, that gap that sometimes exists between who we are and who we hope to be. Today's confession comes to us from the book of Psalms, Psalm 51, of course, Many of you know this was written by King David, a man who is described as being a person after God's own heart. And even though King David was a person after God's own heart, we know that he committed a grievous sin against Bathsheba and against his servant Uriah. David, of course, comes to understand the sin through the prophet Nathan, and he looks deep inside realizing that in order to, to lead his people, he needs to come to grips also with the king that he is, and the king that he hopes to be. I invite everybody into a brief moment of reflection and self-examination as we prepare our hearts and minds to bring God all of ourselves and enter into this rite of confession, forgiveness, and absolution. We confess with the words of King David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived of me. You desire truth in the, in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and put a new spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. For absolution, we read from the book of Lamentations. Credited, of course, to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who spoke truth to Israel's sin, but who also spoke truth to God's steadfast love and forgiving power. Hear these words from the third chapter of Lamentations as your words. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. My friends today, hear this word of forgiveness. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. 
May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ might live in your hearts through faith. Amen. My name is John Greeby. Today's gospel tells us that we are called into Christ's death through our baptism. Now, that seems a little unsettling. I think I would prefer to consider that a butterfly image of the monarch caterpillar crawling into a cocoon and then being transformed into a butterfly seems like a much more pleasant image. However, that is not what is being described. The caterpillar goes through a somewhat violent transformation, but more significantly, we are called to die to our sins. Now, just a few days ago, I managed to burn myself. And in that process, it was quite painful. And the healing has also been somewhat painful. It takes time to heal, and sometimes we have to put band-aids on and things like that. So that transformation of the skin being destroyed and being rebuilt is a significant process. It's a significant transformation. It's dead skin that becomes alive through healing. In Christ, we know that we have to go through this death to sin to be made new again in Christ. So what comes to my mind from that experience 
was something I experienced in 2015 while living at Holden Village. There was a fire. This was a significant fire. It was called the Wolverine Fire. And it swept through the valley leading up to Holden Village. It burned thousands and thousands of acres around Lake Chelan and Stahican, even down towards Chelan itself. We were really concerned as the village was in jeopardy of being burnt to the ground. The fire raged up the valley towards us. We were concerned about the lives of people. We were concerned about the buildings as well. We evacuated through the fire and the destruction was just absolutely incredible. Everything was wiped out. It seemed like there was just no possible way that anything would survive. Now, through forest fire ecology, we understand that forest fires help a forest to be transformed and become new. In fact, the sequoia tree, now this is a pine cone, but not a sequoia pine cone. A sequoia tree deposits its seed pod which then a fire has to burn hot enough so that that pod will open up and the seeds will be exposed. It is through that transformation that new life can come. So if we reflect on this and we think about how scary it is that you know, death might be or the injury, we always worry about those things. It's frightening because it is, it truly is. But the hope that we have in Christ, the new life, the promise of the resurrection is so much greater than the fear of the death could ever be. So when we talk about this with kids, when we think about you guys, think about it in terms of that transformation of the butterfly or the transformation of the seed pod so that new life can come. Be assured and rest assured that Christ is with you in all things. Let us pray. May the Lord be with you. Gracious God, I give you thanks that you truly have called us to die to sin. That the brokenness in the world we experience is just awful at times. And it is such a burden to experience it. Please help us to, to experience the fullness of our baptism to live as though we have eternal life and that we have been transformed by your baptism. Show us your love and help us to love one another. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful day and have a wonderful week. Take care. The first lesson is from Romans 6, beginning at the first verse. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin-miserable life, no longer at sin's every beck and call. What we believe is this, if we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. Here ends the reading. Our gospel today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a student to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. 
If the head of the household has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of the household? Do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can kill both the body and the soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them can fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will also disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you. Today we find ourselves in the second half of the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We find ourselves just after a particular section of Matthew's gospel where Jesus in nine different stories brings the message of the kingdom directly into people's lives through healings and miracles and other uh, and other shows of power of his authority and we find that after every three of these stories uh, Jesus does something else he reiterates this call to the disciples to follow me in chapter 9, we're at the last follow me chapter, and we also then get the additional teaching, kind of the conclusion of this whole section, where Jesus then goes on to describe to his disciples, and this is what's going to happen when you follow me. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says uh, for chapter 10. Jesus says, I am sending you. Proclaim the kingdom is near. Some will listen. Some will not. Have compassion. Heal. Cast out evil. Restore to life what is dead. I am sending you. I am sending you like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as as doves. If a master is ridiculed and persecuted, don't imagine as servants that you will escape persecution. In the face of persecution, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body because they cannot kill the soul. I come not to bring peace but a sword. Some will listen, some will not. This will cause painful division, even between family and friends. Take up the cross and follow me. Lose your life for my sake, then you will know life fully. Jesus 
certainly isn't pulling any punches in this teaching. He knows how hard it will be for us to follow. And we might ask ourselves, why? Why is this necessarily so difficult? Following Jesus at its core is transformational. To follow Jesus is to face our Lord. And brothers and sisters, Jesus meets us with sword in hand. The sword is described by Paul and others as being the very word of God. And that's who we say Jesus is, right? Jesus is the word of God incarnate. So it makes sense that Jesus would be holding the sword, an important reminder to us of who he is. And then we're told that the word of God has the ability, the power to see to the very heart of who we are. The word of God, the sword Jesus brings, cuts to the truth of who we are, cuts past any facade that we try to put up, cuts past any lies that we tell ourselves, cuts through all the pain and the fear that we use to shield ourselves from the rest of the world, from God. The word of God, the sword Jesus brings, desires one thing, to free us from all that binds us, to transform us so that we can continue to follow the voice of our Lord. And this transformation, brothers and sisters, it's painful. I have never met a human who enjoys confronting the facades that we carefully create in our lives or enjoys confronting the lies that we tell ourselves or enjoys confronting the pain and the fear and the walls that we've built up to protect ourselves. It's not easy. It means facing truth within us that is difficult to bear. I want to share with you just one of the lies that I used to tell myself all the time. It was a very comforting lie. It was a very naive lie. And I don't think I'm the only one who tells themselves this, but this is the lie I used to tell myself. I used to say to myself, once upon a time, humans were violent and out of control and cruel to each other. But now, today, we humans have changed. We've learned from our past. We certainly won't repeat the same mistakes of the past. And we are now better, more kind, and more loving than our ancestors. Some of you may be laughing right now at my naivete. Jesus stood in front of me as I told myself this lie and spoke truth to me. Jesus said to me, come on, follow me. And I did. I followed Jesus to El Salvador and communities ravaged by civil war, and then by opportunistic companies seeking profit. I followed Jesus to China and to communities of Christians meeting in secret for fear of persecution. I followed Jesus to the Philippines and communities being torn apart by corruption and greed of multinational corporations and extrajudicial killings. I followed Jesus to the caskets of good people who were murdered simply for telling the truth and standing up for what was right. I followed Jesus to the front lines 
as we sought to release wrongfully and unjustly imprisoned men and women. And sometimes with orders in our hands for their release, stood before an array of military with guns pointed at us, refusing to let us enter and set the prisoners free, that we had the court paperwork that would allow us to do just that. I followed Jesus to California and walked through the graveyards of the hundreds of white crosses marked no identificado. Unknown migrants who had died crossing in the desert. I followed Jesus to the border wall, watching families share meal through the gaps in the fences. I followed Jesus to Arizona and witnessed a community of God's people in their pain treat each other so cruelly over a question of love and the worthiness of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. I followed Jesus to Minnesota, where it was made clear to me I did not belong. I followed Jesus to New York and will never forget five years to the day, June 21st, standing before the congregation I served and informing them that a member of another ELCA congregation had walked into a Bible study at Emmanuel AME in Charleston and murdered nine black beloved brothers and sisters. And I followed Jesus back home to Washington. The sword our Lord brings is transformational. And the image of the sword is not without purpose. It is an instrument meant to cleave. And there is nothing comfortable about that. Believe me when I say that each of the above experiences and many more revealed something deep within me that I needed to confront, that I needed to confess, that I needed to repent of, and that I needed to denounce. It's not that Jesus showed me these things so that I would think, well, the world's got problems, <laughs> but I'm good. No, <laughs> that sort of truth was to show me deeply in myself what I needed to repent of, the transformation that needed to happen within my own heart. I had to reveal, and it had to be shown to me, my own selfishness, my own fear, my own greed, my own desire for comfort, my own prejudice, my deep desire to simplify an issue so I can make a quick ju judgment, feel good about that decision, and just not worry about how complex an issue might actually be. I liked that I lived in a comforting place of um, distrust that Jesus really meant what he said when he taught us to love our neighbor, to care for the hungry, to care for the orphans, to care for the homeless, to care for the refugee, to care for the oppressed, to care for the unwanted. I had to confront that lie. I had to understand that Jesus is the word of God, and I can't ignore that. Believe me when I say, I have a long, long way to go. Jesus brings that sword before me each and every day. Sometimes I run. Sometimes 
I fall to my knees. And here's the hard truth. When Jesus stands before us and we face that transformation and we begin to receive that transformation that Jesus works in us, and, and believe me when I say it's God's work for transformation, it's not something we do on our own, but when we begin to go through that transformation, we begin to experience exactly what Jesus talks about in this chapter. We begin to face persecution and division among our families and among our friends because we will find that we can no longer be idle and stay silent. We will find ourselves following Jesus right into the fray, right into the thick of things. And hearing Jesus and the Spirit say to us, speak the truth, even if it's unwelcome, but speak restorative truth, speak reconciling truth, speak transformational truth. You know, the first disciples faced all of this. They faced persecution from the outside, certainly, and they faced deep division from within. They witnessed Paul as he is transformed by the truth of Jesus and then brings to them the truth that Jesus is teaching, and that is that the Gentiles are worthy of the gospel and that they can let go of the practice of circumcision. Huge division over this. They witness Peter's transformation as Jesus speaks the truth about what is now clean, what is now worthy in God's eyes, and a walking away from the purity laws that had been set down before for their ancestors. And we could go on. The divisions continue and continue to today. And as Jesus stands before us and we face these really hard truths, there is, brothers and sisters, a yet more important truth that Jesus speaks to us. As we face our Lord and the sword he brings, as he sees you, sees into the heart of who you are, sees all of you, there is one reaction, one reaction that our Lord has to you. And, and I'll give you a hint. Pastor Eric talked about this a lot last week in his sermon. Jesus looks at you and sees you and has compassion on you. Jesus knows your pain, knows who you are, the beautiful, the broken, and has compassion for you. When faced with the truth of who we are, we can run, we can follow our knees. I've done both. But here's what I know, brothers and sisters. If we run, we will find that we run straight into the arms of our Lord. He is not going to let you go. If we fall to our knees, he will be there to catch you and hold you and stand you up again. If you cannot yet face the truth, Jesus doesn't send you away. If you can't yet let go, the Spirit does not abandon you. If we are afraid of transformation, afraid of the conflict, Jesus still calls you. Follow me. Jesus still forgives you and clothes you with righteousness. I said earlier that the lie Jesus exposed to me and in me left me in pieces. But Jesus didn't leave me that way, didn't leave me broken and without hope. Jesus revealed a different truth. Yes, we as humans still struggle, but that's not the end of the story. I followed Jesus to El Salvador and witnessed reconciliation and grace beyond measure. I followed Jesus to China and witnessed overwhelming faith and joy. I followed Jesus to the Philippines and witnessed unwavering commitment to justice and peace. 
I followed Jesus to Arizona and witnessed a community that didn't give up on their love for each other and found healing and new life. I followed Jesus to California and witnessed compassion and hope. I followed Jesus to Minnesota and witnessed dedication to the gospel. I followed Jesus to New York and witnessed strength in the unity of the body of Christ. And I followed Jesus home to Washington. The good news, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus does not bring the sword to leave us broken. Jesus brings the sword of truth to set you free, to transform and restore, to bring abundant life, to heal and reconcile and forgive. I used to believe a lie, a lie that I imagined that humans all on our own could achieve society's equality and reconciliation and compassion and peace. Jesus told me the truth. There is a kingdom established by the word of God. There is a kingdom Jesus was willing to die for, a kingdom Jesus was willing to rise for, a kingdom of hope and forgiveness, a kingdom for all people of this earth, a kingdom where the first will be last and the last will be first, where none are hungry or thirsty or without shelter or love or companionship or any of the things that we deeply desire. A kingdom where the oppressed sit across the table from their oppressors in reconciliation. A kingdom where we, the ones that we convinced ourselves were not worthy of the kingdom, sit across from us and offer us forgiveness. A kingdom of peace brought about by our Lord's truth. A kingdom Jesus gifts you. When Jesus says follow, it is to follow him into this kingdom. And to invite others along the way. Everyone, no conditions. Invite them just as they are into this kingdom. Jesus will work the transformation in us, in our neighbor. But beloved, listen to what Jesus is saying. You are worthy. Worthy of the freedom only our Lord can bring. Your neighbor is worthy. Worthy of the kingdom God is creating among us. Do not be afraid of the truth. Amen. Captain's love.
Pastor Krista for your message. Together we join now to confess our faith. I invite you, if you are at home, again, if you want to stand up, you can stand up. If you're near somebody that you love, even if you just like them, okay, you can grab their hands. If you're with a child, you can pick that child up, confess this faith right into their ears as they start learning uh, words and symbols of the faith that you will pass on to them. Even though separated, separated by distance, we are together in our confession. Know that as you speak this, there are those around you also speaking this with one voice. Together we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. People of God say together, Amen. Together, even though spread far and wide, we pray for the church, for our world, and for all who are in need. Creator God, thank you for bringing all kinds of different people into your church. Thank you for tall people and short people, for men and women, for boys and girls for people with all kinds of skin colors, for people who speak all kinds of languages, for funny people and for serious people made. Thank you for bringing us all together in love for you. Creator God, you give us all we need to live and grow. Be with farmers as they plant and ready their fields. Give us strength to those who will harvest fruits and vegetables for our tables. Help us protect creation that creation may protect and nurture. nurture us. God of goodness, be with all those who work for peace and justice. Help us to make sure everyone in our world has enough food, enough clothing, and enough of everything to live happy, healthy lives. Help us to give of what we have so that all people may have enough. Loving God, be with those who suffer. Encourage those who feel put down. Heal those who are sick. Comfort those who are sad. Forgive those who are, feel guilty. And bring together those who are in conflict. Father God, you are a good, good father. Today, please bless all fathers, grandfathers, uncles, big brothers, teachers, and anybody who nurtures and raises children. Thank you, Lord, for good dads and all they teach us. Internal God, we thank you for the saints, saints who have gone before us. 
We thank you for fathers, grandfathers, uncles, brothers, teachers, and nurturers who have passed away. Thank you for all the good images of Father passed on to us. We pray all these prayers, Lord, knowing that you hear us. Thank you for hearing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together. Amen. Now let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Sheely family, for leading us in prayer. Today, my people, may the peace of the Lord be with you all. As you stand up and shake hands or hug or put little signs of crosses on those you love heads, I welcome you to remember some of the folks you'd normally be sharing with the peace with on Sunday morning. And if you see people on this board, I'm outside Lutheran, I realize you're not on this board, but if you can think of people that you'd be sharing the peace with, offer up some good vibes, a word of prayer, something for a familiar face that comes to mind. Now for some announcements from Sammamish Hills Lutheran Church. Once again, a happy Father's Day to all dads out there, all grandpas, all uncles, all big brothers. Please, once again, feel free to high-five each other, uh, or as my son would probably do to me, come up and smack me in the back and uh, uh, thank each other for, for your presence, for that presence in your lives. Also a reminder that uh, we are hard underway with plans for drive-in vacation Bible school here at Sammamish Hills Lutheran Church. Registration is open now. Just go to our website and you can find out how to register. And that happens from July 20th to 21st. Vacation Bible school is the 20th to the 24th of July. Also a thanks to Jeff Baker who ran our, our, our last installment of our Theology Pub Fellowship Gathering this past Thursday at 7 p.m. The next Theology Pub will be Thursday, July 2nd at 7 p.m. Please contact either Jeff Baker or myself if you'd like to be part of that. Something special to mark on your calendar is coming up on Sunday, July 5th. Our church, Mount Si Lutheran Church, is partnering with a number of other churches in the East King County cluster of ELCA Lutheran Churches to put on a special joint service. Please be present for that. There's going to be special music, a uh, special message, all kinds of different things that are going to be creatively put together by all the churches. Of course, that will be, as usual, online on July 5th. Uh, finally, Anna Morris is hard at work putting together Shoshone and Sammamish Confirmation Camp this year. We are going to be in Sammamish this year in order to practice all necessary social distancing requirements. If you're interested, and you should be, in attending, please connect with Anna or myself. That will be on August 6th to the 9th, so be looking for information on that if you're a part of our student ministries, part of our college ministries, part of our volunteer force. And as always, we are so thankful for your gifts during this time and how you support Sammamish Hills Lutheran Church through your time, through your talents, through your treasures, through your musical contributions to our regular Sunday worship, through your encouragement and prayer for staff, through your encouragement and prayer for each other. Please take some time now to consider a special gift to Sammamish Hills Lutheran Church. You can donate online at www.shlc.org or of course you can send a donation through the mail. Thank you very much for your service to our church and our community. God bless. Hi folks, a few announcements for you. 
Uh, first of all, our registration for VBS is up on the website. If you are interested in participating in VBS, please go to the website and all the information is there. If you have any questions, please reach out to John Greeby and he will give you the information that you need on that. Uh, also, a thanks to the 30 plus people who came to our coffee hour last Sunday uh, via Zoom. It was a lot of fun and the group really wants to do it again. So we're gonna start doing this every other week. So the next time we'll have a Zoom coffee hour will be next Sunday, the 28th of June. So that will be our next opportunity uh, to gather together in that way. Other announcements I believe have gone out in the weekly updates. At this time, I would like to invite you into our space of offering. I invite you into a space of thanksgiving, of giving back and giving thanks to our God for everything that we have received. As we return to the Lord and know that these funds that we give go to God's kingdom work, and we thank our congregations for their faithful stewardship of, of the monies that are given. Uh, they are deeply appreciated and we thank you for your generosity. Please enjoy the music as we enter this time of offering. You may donate online at either of our congregation's websites, or you can certainly write a check and put that in the mail. Thank you again, brothers and sisters, for your faithfulness in this time. <laughs> everybody watching to stick around after the benediction again for our special Father's Day blessing. The Lord be with you. Father, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving as we leave worship today. We pray for all the ways that you have challenged us, for all the ways you have comforted us, 
for all of the ways that you have helped us reflect inside and for how you've called us to now serve outside. Lord, you promised that the words that leave your mouth do not leave the world unchanged. May all that we heard today through music and prayer and word, Lord, never leave us unchanged, but may we go forward as new people, new in how we comport ourselves in relationship to all, new, Lord, in the grace we offer ourselves and our brothers and sisters. Guide us, Lord, to walk into our new life with you. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. My friends, today may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
fighting. Thank you for playing with us. We love you. From Spence and Pia. <laughs> dad because he's going to let me drive the car today. I love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for loving me. We love you. Love you. Disneyland. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day, Day, Dad. We, we love, love you. you. Happy Father's Day. I thank you for always making me laugh. I thank you for helping us learn and hard situations right now. We I love you. you! Happy Father's Day! We thank you for being such an awesome and funny dad. We, we love, love you. you! Hey pups, I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. Pretty soon my hair will be as long as yours, or maybe longer. Love you. Talk to you soon. Happy Father's Day, Dad! Love, love you so, so much! Glad, Glad you shaved, shaved the beard! Love him so much! Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We love you. And I thank you that for all that you do. We love you. Bye. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for, for helping me sometimes. Thank you for making me drawings. We love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. We love you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for loving us and working hard. We love, we love you. you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you for being our number one supporter. We love you. Dad, because he makes me laugh. And he's funny. Happy Father's Day. I love you. Dad, happy Father's Day. Love you. Bye. Hi, I'm Susan Dahl. I'm Letha Dahl. And we want to say Happy Father's Day to the greatest dad in the whole wide world, John Dahl. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills. Yay, traffic. Woohoo, taxes. Yes, laundry. Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason, texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. 
That's a really good idea. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna dance in the river. Dance in the river. We're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna jump. Deep cries out to you, deep cries out.